Good morning, folks. Good morning. It is a good morning. So welcome back to another Shotgun Saturday with ICT. Uh, today's presentation for February 18th, 2023 is dealing with the topic of the measure of the tape. Now, obviously, when we've been watching the live streams and with my commentary over each individual one minute candlestick, many of you have had a great deal of new learning, new observations, things that uh, you didn't think were possible. You're seeing evidence to the contrary. And we have been introducing two new concepts over the last two weeks or so. Uh, the NWOG and the NDOG, which is the new week opening gap and new day opening gap. And you're seeing the effectiveness of knowing having that on your chart and the influence over price that it holds and how it can gravitate back towards those levels. And I want to touch a little bit about that today and go through all as much as I have on my notes. I have slated about 60 minutes. That doesn't mean I'll go for a full 60 minutes. It just means that I have about 60 minutes. So once we're done that, regardless, I must be off by 10 o'clock. So a little bit more time structured uh, one today. So for your notes, you want to go back and look at the review. And incidentally, I have not been very good about keeping the live streams and the lectures for 2023 mentorship for YouTube, collated, in other words, bringing them together in one playlist. So I have done that this morning. And at first glance, it looks like everything is in relatively close order. I think there's a few of them that are out of order, but they're not essential for that to be like that. Uh, some of Most of them have the dates for the presentations anyway. Some of them don't. And you're welcome to uh, send me a, a tweet. Let me know which one needs to go where. I just did it real quick because I noticed this morning when someone asked about a particular lecture that I've done, I, I prompted them to go to the 2023 mentorship playlist on my YouTube channel. <laughs> now I discovered that I haven't been keeping up with that. So uh, a lot of things going on. And hopefully, you know, you'll be able to go to that playlist now and get all the things that you maybe have missed. But the review on February 12th of 2023, it's basically giving you my expectation going into the new week, which is always, always uncertain. Okay, so in your notes, you want to write this down. Uh, there's three uncertainties that you have to embrace. You have to knowingly, willingly embrace Three specific uncertainties in market and in speculation. Number one, black swan events. A black swan event is something that nobody can expect. No one can time it. It just comes out of nowhere. There's a time or season when it's probably likely, and we've been on a sustained timeline for that. We've been seeing all kinds of different black swan events over the last three years or so and that's basically covid related um war related all kinds of economic upheaval and we're we have one that's looming now with the central bank digital currencies so that's going to absolutely impact the markets and currency trading so that's an uncertainty okay that that black swan event that thing that pops out of nowhere that can cause the market go crashing down or raging higher you know, depending upon what the driver is or what what the event is the second is we do not no one knows i don't know and you're never going to learn where the new week sunday price opens and you never know for number three where the gap opening opening price at 6 p.m. will be. So the new day opening gap and the new week opening gap and black swans, they are three uncertainties that you have to embrace. And the wonderful thing is, with the exception of the first one, 
The other two, we don't need to know what they are. But once we have them, it gives us insight, which means sitting on your hands, allowing the tape to give you the storyline. Let the price tell you it. Don't try to guess it. Don't try to forecast where these opening prices are going to be. Now I'm going to teach how we can anticipate sometimes, not all the time, sometimes where the gap would move in our favor at either the new week opening gap or the new day opening gap. So those lessons are, are forthcoming as we go deeper into March content. If we look at the review on the 12th of 2023, the two scenarios I would have preferred to see, neither of which gave me an outline to work with when we started trading on Sunday. We had a higher gap opening, not by much, and it traded back down into the range that was formed in the last hour or so of trading on Friday, previous Friday, not yesterday. But I mentioned that if we were to gap higher, that would send my mindset to looking for it to trade higher into imbalances and maybe press into a higher time frame uh, order flow. But I preferred gun to my head, which is always what I do, because I know some of you will invariably listen to what I'm saying and say, he's calling both sides. No, I will go both sides when I have no idea where it's going to go next. But then I co-sign by saying, but if I had a gun to my head, this is what I say. So I'm always giving you my opinion, but my opinion is always laced and provided with a disclaimer stating that you know, we're only talking about what I believe may happen, not that I have hard evidence to prove that the bias is going to be this or that. So that way you can see that because of that, that uncertainty, this is the reason why I don't speculate as much on Sundays anymore. I don't do a lot of the over the weekend holding of trades anymore because there's too much gap risk. What is gap risk? What we were talking about so far in this presentation. You don't know where we're going to open on Sunday. I don't know. No one knows. It could be an enormous gap difference between Friday's closing price, higher or lower. You have absolutely no way of knowing what that's going to be. And you don't know if it's going to gap severely away from Friday's closing price and then still scream in the direction of the gap opening price. You don't know that. I don't know that. So we have to always see what those opening prices are going to do. Once they give it, sit on your hands and wait. What are we looking for? Continuation or failure and reject and return back into the range that was created by the gap opening price and the previous session closing price. Having these uncertainties in price, many times that uncertainty and fear and anxiety about not knowing what's going to happen at those times leaks into other times where the market is a little bit more predictable. Now, I say that loosely because I don't want to convey the idea that you're going to know. You're going to know where price is going to go. No. You're going to have a measured, statistically weighed out. Things have been more times like this than not type of scenario, which is why I say the first lesson I teach you as a student is to understand where the market's likely to go into next. What's the potential draw on liquidity? Is it above market price now or is it below market price? Notice that I don't ever say, and I, my lessons never state that it's absolutely, unequivocally, without a doubt, <laughs> promised that it's going to go to that level above or below. It's just more likely to do that. Now, more likely is equivalent to you, more likely than not, arriving to your job safely and soundly in the manner you woke up and left your bed when you go to work 
the same odds are that in the marketplace, but you don't see it that way because you're placing what? You're placing the emphasis of a monetary reward or loss on the transition between you entering your car and getting to work. No, you don't do that, but you do the same thing with trading though, as you should. You should have the measure of respect, but you don't think about the monetary loss of potentially driving over a nail and getting a flat tire, do you? Or curbing a tire, busting it, getting into an accident because you were looking at ICT tweets and scrolling through a video to hear a certain part that you didn't get to and something happens that causes you to crash. Those things, those uncertainties, are always going to be in the marketplace. But what I'm teaching you to do with the tape reading is allowing you to see the things that are going to be more pertinent to you as a trader. What makes you tick as a trader? We all are studying price delivery. We're all understanding that these concepts have an influence over what price is going to do. But you don't know which one you're going to use for your setup. Some of you are at stages where you can see them perfectly in hindsight when I show them to you, and it makes perfect sense, and you can't see it real time. That's normal. Some of you can't even understand the logic with me showing it to you in hindsight because you're absolutely brand new, and that's normal too. Some of you are now discovering how comfortable it's becoming for you to see real-time one-minute candles painting and the logic behind where price is going to gravitate towards that draw or inefficiency that's going to pull price higher or lower, it's not so random anymore. And that is now normal for you. You're all at different stages of your development. And the measure of the tape is going to provide you a different measurement based on the time you've been spending with me and the concepts I teach. But understanding there are there's three primary uncertainties that you cannot absolutely know and you will never know. And I promise you, I have no secret weapon, no algorithm twist, no nothing in Enigma tells me where the opening price is going to be. Nothing. I have absolutely no. I have to submit myself to the will of the marketplace. And once it does whatever it's going to do at these times, then I measure what it is I'm looking for. What is it that I'm looking for? I've shown you this week. We traded down to certain levels after a gap lower. I want to see it run buy side. It does. I want to see it run sell side. It does. And those narratives during those live streams that I'm telling you, because we're not lost in price. <laughs> we're not lost in price. We're not lost in the candlestick jungle. We're waiting for a clear path to a destination that we have already set out for looking in a direction, this is where we're likely to go, but we have to wait. We have to wait for the market to tell us, okay, now it's done its damage in tricking other traders into thinking it's going to go the opposite direction to that. That's manipulation. That's the thing that we like to wait for after these gaps, after the session open at 930, at the 830 news embargo when it lifts. We're waiting for those little tricks. There's little unfortunate events that the lesser informed speculators are not aware of. And they fall victim because they're using concepts they've learned in books based on breakout strategies. And then or looking for confirmation after a move has began and they chase price. So in my live sessions, I'm many times drawing on the ideas that you as a retail trader or someone that is not in our community that trades purely on retail logic, how they're going to perceive price at that moment. And the times I'm saying that, I want you to write down your notes. When I say those things, when I'm referring to a retail trader's mindset or a concept that they may see right now, or they're, they're shorting here or they're, they're bullish here, or if I'm referencing where their stops would be, at that moment, and I failed to mention this prior to this now, but I've mentioned it in passing in lectures. But when I'm doing a live session and I'm calling real-time candlesticks and where the price is going to go and what it shouldn't shouldn't do, 
when I mention or reference retail logic or retail stops, at that moment, at that very moment, I want you to think about that wrestling match, that arm wrestling match, that war between the real market maker versus the people that trade on patterns for pattern's sake. The emphasis of believing that price is going to go up. The hopes and fears, the outcomes of billions of dollars. Where is it more likely to follow the logic of some kind of harmonic animal pattern, some kind of Fibonacci ratio, Gartley retracement type thing, a butterfly, crab, shark? All those things, billions of dollars are going to be weighed in the balances on those gimmicks or is it based on real order flow and where existing orders are above or below the marketplace? Clearly, clearly, it's the latter. Large institutions, large banks are not trading on harmonic animal themed named patterns. They're not doing that, folks. They're never teaching you what they're really doing. You hear people say, learn how to trade like the banks. They're not teaching you how banks trade. I'm teaching you how banks trade. The logic is proven. It's to the tick precision. It's predictable. It's not something that's ambiguous. We're looking for very specific things to repeat at a specific time of day. And that when that logic shows itself at the same time that some retail logic theory concept pattern, and I'm just going to say pattern because predominantly, and this is my experience when I was learning as a new trader back in 1992 in the first five or six years of it, most of what I was looking for was a pattern with an indicator to tell me something. When nobody was telling me to look at the things I'm teaching you, which is time and price. I was more concerned about if my Fibonacci was set to the right settings. Was I really in an oversold condition? Because not every one of my in indicators would agree that we're oversold yet. I would use this person's book because cause it just came out. I figured, OK, this is the person that knows something new now because he produced a new book. And it was the same stuff. It was the same things all the time. So when we look at price, we're looking for specific times of the day to produce a specific expectation that we hold over the price. We only are interested if price can go to this level above where we are right now. That's buy side. That means we're bullish. We are not trading yet. We're anticipating the market to give us some kind of tipping of its hand. We're waiting for some kind of algorithmic display in price action that would qualify for now. This is the time when we want to engage. Right now, our attention at that point is, is interested in seeing it do certain things at a specific time. But once those things occur, what is that? A shift in market structure. A run on stops. That's it. Two things. That's it. That's it. It's either going to run stops. Then we're going to wait for a rejection of that. What happens after that? A breaker. But, but, no. If it runs stops, we're looking for a breaker. But what happens if it hasn't gone down below? What would be a breaker yet? We're considering any imbalance prior to that. Oh, well, that seems pretty easy. Yes, what I've been saying all along. But you're trying to bring in commitment of traders and ICT stingers and catapults and whiplash patterns and everything else that I've ever taught. You're trying to bring everything to it. 
Think about it. When you get invited to a party, you know your favorite outfits, right? You know, you know what those favorite outfits are, especially the ladies listening. You know that's the one you look like the bomb in. Now, when you get invited to the party, you're scrambling initially. Do I really want to wear this? Do I want to wear this? Do, I want to... Do you bring all five or six of your favorite outfits that you look the bomb in? Of course not. Of course not. You settle in on one. And that's exactly what you're doing as a trader. You're going to settle in on that one pattern, concept, PD array, multiplier, that thing that you're going to use as a trader. That's where you're going to be the bomb in. Now, you look good in all the other outfits. But you have a, a special affinity for this particular one. And that's the one you want to represent yourself in. Well, as a trader, it's no different. I'm giving you the invitation every day in a live session to come to the party. But you're going to pick out what particular PD array resonates with you. It matters not what anybody else thinks about what you should trade or, or use as a catalyst for getting into a trade. It matters not what my opinion of my favorite ones are. Many of you ask a lot of times, hey, look, you know, you teach a lot of things, but what's your favorite setup? Because it's going to be easier for me to just cut through all the chaff and go right to what ICT's favorite is. They're all my favorite. <laughs> They're all my favorite based on whatever the market's doing. I'm plug and play. I've, I've authored these things so I can pick and choose whatever one I want to use. I can use all of them if I want to, which is what you see me doing when I'm doing pyramid entries. I'm literally using every single one of them that's available at that time during that market move. But not every single PD array is going to exist in every single price run, which is the benefit of understanding them holistically, not just individually, because I could literally write a book three, 400 pages long and not even scratch the surface on one PD array at a time. That's how deep this can be. But it need not be that complicated. It just simply needs to be, which one do you like the most? Which one makes the most sense to you right now? And bloom where you're planted. Don't think that that's the best you can be or where you're ever going to be as a trader. It just means that gives you the first initial foundation to start your growth from, which is really critical as a, as a developing student because it's too easy to springboard and bounce around to different teachers, concepts, approaches, all kinds of things. And you'll never learn. You'll never learn that way. You'll be introduced to new things. Like a drug. Here, try this one. Here, now try this one. Here, try this one. And you're never really clear-headed and focused on the thing that you're supposed to be looking for right now, which is one specific model that you can start with and build an understanding from and grow as a trader. And I've said it many times, but just for the folks that are wondering, uh, my first pattern that made consistency with me was when I was using an oversold condition on an hourly chart when I thought that the daily and the weekly were going to go up to an old high. That was it. A previous week high or the high in the last three days. That was my target. I was using something as simple as a bullish divergence and a slow stochastic. And that's what I was using. But because the market, now this is, this is, I want you to understand this, because the market that I was looking at was already predisposed to go higher anyway, and I couldn't articulate it becoming bullish or bearish outside the scope of whatever the slope of a 50-day moving average was being, was being plotted on my daily chart. So I looked at where we are today at the time of my analysis and looked back nine days. If the slope of that 50-day moving average was higher today than it was nine days ago, that was my bias. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> it was dumb, right? Dumb. But the logic was, as long as it's doing that, then I'll buy, especially if the 60-minute or hourly chart was oversold and it diverged bullishly in a stochastic. That means it made a lower low in stochastic. I'm sorry, lower low in price hourly. The hourly candles went lower, but the stochastic failed to make a lower low. Then I used that the next day. I would wait for a higher opening because I was downloading end of day data. So I had to wait for the, the session to open 
because the commodity markets had session times. And we would see the opening price at the bond market. We would see the opening price in the grain market. We would see the opening price in the S&P and the currency futures. And I would look for a higher price gap opening. And then if it traded down into the gap halfway, I would buy that. That was my that was my whole model. That was it. And honestly, if you use institutional order flow and higher time frame and you know where it's likely to go, you know that still works today. What did you just say? What did you just say, ICT? Did you just sin? You just sinned. <laughs> this is sacrilegious. Look at this. This guy's talking about indicators. No, I'm telling you how it came up. Now, let me tell you how and why it worked. The market was already going higher. I didn't have the experience. I didn't have the wherewithal to know what makes the market continuously bullish. So the deciding factor, which is what every retail trader does with their indicators, their gimmicks, their toys, all these things are just a driver for you. Like when I say gun to my head, that's the gun to the head for a retail trader because otherwise they have no idea what they're doing. They have to have an instigation, a, a catalyst, a cause, an abrupt decision-making event. That, that's what has to happen. And because most traders have really no idea what the hell the market's doing, they rely on something like a pattern, a, an approach, some kind of technique that they learned that they have conveniently subscribed a faith-based logic to when it has nothing to do with what the market's going to do, but it gives them their decision-making moment. This is what I'm going to do and why. The only difference between that and what I'm teaching all of you as a student is I'm teaching you what really makes the market go up or go down. Not looking at these gimmicks, these toys, these things as the reason for you deciding what to do. Was the fact that the 50-day moving average, when I was trading in the 90s, today's value in the 50-day moving average plotted on a daily chart, if that value was higher than it was nine days ago, in my mind, that means it's going to keep going up. Well, what do you think happened when I got into a price run that went to a fair value gap that was just below the high I was looking to go to as a target. It would retrace. And it would scare me. And I would jam my stop loss up too tight and I'll get stopped out. Or it never got to those levels I wanted to see it go to. It went to a fair value gap that was just below those highs. And I added. And then I fought it as it dropped down. The whole time, that moving average on the daily chart was telling me it's bullish. No, no. It was bullshit. Okay? That's the equivalent of the bull that it had in it. Because I was looking at something that had absolutely no bearing on where price was going to go next. All it was doing was saying what was obvious anyway, if I just looked at the open, high, low, and close. The market's been going up. I don't need, you don't need a moving average to tell you that. And I don't need, and you don't need an overbought and oversold indicator to tell you if it's overbought. So those things are useful for traders that need to have a catalyst, something to get them into a trade. Because they have no understanding about what price is doing. They have an understanding and a faith-based logic that these patterns should do this. Now think about what you're saying. This is exactly what I was doing. I was saying that my nine-day moving average difference between on a 50-day moving average, the difference between today's value and nine days ago is going to tell me if I should trust price going up or down. Instead of simply taking that shit off the chart and looking at the price. It was going up. 
Moving averages only crunch and smooth out what's already happened. Of course it's going to be going up, and you don't need a trend line. But see, what that does is it gives you a focal point to take all of your attention and say, okay, I'm going to look at this thing, this trend line, this moving average, this harmonic pattern, this whatever, whatever you want to call it, whatever you want to bring to the, the discussion of retail logic and trading. That thing, that's your point of interest. That's your decision-making mechanism. If it does this, I'll do that. If it doesn't do this, I'm doing nothing. And the only thing I've been doing is taking your attention off that bullshit and putting it on price itself because it's going to tell you everything you want to know. You want to know when it's going to return, re reverse? I'll, it'll tell you that. You want to want to know when it's getting ready to explode and move in one direction? It'll tell you that too. You want to know when it's going to be consolidating and hard to trade and can be in choppy conditions? I've proven that it tells you that too. So pray tell, why the fuck would you want to look at anything else? Open high, low, and close tells you everything. It tells you everything. And you don't need to look outside of it to derive a bias, a narrative, or a trade idea. When we're looking at the new week opening gaps, one of the things I've already mentioned it before, but you need to make sure you have this in your notes. The new week opening gap on trending days or trending weeks where we're going to have a one direction railroad ride away from where we opened up. The new week opening gap is going to be little to no importance. Maybe used one time intra-week and then it just never comes back to it again. I taught you that if we keep going back to it and gravitating to it, that conference, we're going to be in a sustained consolidation. It means that the market's not likely to do what? Have these big tear-off runs. I've explained that to you this week beforehand. Before it did what your chart shows right now, I told you that we will be in a consolidation. I took you through the daily chart and I told you, look where we're at. We're in this range. What was also some qualifying things that helped support that narrative of why I was confident in telling you that. Because we had two volume imbalances on the daily chart inside that small little range. You know, the same volume imbalance I told you in the February 12th review on YouTube before the week even opened up. I told you, have them on your charts and extend them through the entirety of the week. I'll touch on that a little bit later in this discussion. But New week opening gap is fair value. It's a static value between the opening price on Sunday and the closing price on Friday and the midpoint of that, which is consequent encroachment. Those three specific price levels are going to be very, very sensitive throughout the spectrum of a trading week if it's going to be range bound. So you see people say, I'm, I don't do very well in trending markets. And they'll say, I do very, very well in consolidating or consolidating you know, choppy markets. Okay. And you see other people say, I can't do good in choppy consolidations. I like trending markets. Okay. I have something for all of you. My toys, they play in every market profile. Every single one of them. Which is why I teach market profiles, not market profile like you think. Market profiles or templates. Think of them as schematics on what the market should do conceptually on a line basis. Okay. We're going to talk about that too. Because the market tends to do these types of things with a greater sense of repetitiveness and transparency. It many times telegraphs, it's going to be doing these very things and you simply have to align your expectations and then wait for the time of day, day of week, for it to occur. What, what do you mean by that? It's too ambiguous. It's too vague, Michael. Think about what I gave you in my analysis throughout this week, in the live sessions, in the reviews, and in the pre-market 
analysis before Sunday even opened. I said that we're going to be likely to see a risk-off scenario. Risk-off means dollar index is higher. All other markets are lower. So if you haven't done this yet in your notes, risk off, dollar higher, markets lower. Risk on, dollar lower, markets higher. What do you mean markets higher? Anything other than dollar. Yen, pound, gold, oil, equities, index futures. Notice I didn't say crypto. <laughs> I don't know, man. Don't ask me about crypto. Okay, I'm clueless. I have no idea. But every other market will be pressured. If you want to talk about buying and selling pressure, that exists between the mechanism between risk on and risk off. If the dollar's going higher, it's going to be very easy for other markets to drop. And your sell models can be trusted. Your institutional order flow, when it's bearish, can be trusted. Your premium arrays can be trusted. But if the dollar index is consolidating and it's stuck, that's going to be seen in other markets too. It doesn't mean that all markets in that condition will be stagnant and consolidating. It just means that that's the, the expectation you should hold. But within that, that tells you a story. What is that, Michael? What, what's, what's, what are you getting at, man? Lean in real close. If we have a range-bound consolidation in dollar index, in Forex, you can look at the relationship between pairs like Euro-Pound because the dollar index is being held. It doesn't mean that every foreign exchange market or pair is going to be consolidating. It just means now when dollars being held in consolidation, the crosses like Euro pound, Aussie yen, pound yen, those exotic crosses will be manipulated and you'll see the runs occur in those markets versus the dollar pairs. My techniques work in every market profile. The problem is you're not spending enough time looking at what market profile we are in. And I'm telling you where we're at before we even start trading. Let's go back to the 12th of February. Before the market opened up, I stated that I believe that the dollar is going to go higher. I believe still that the dollar is likely to trade up into those relative equal highs that I have shaded in orange. There's buy side resting up there. Unless we see something completely undermine that expectation this week, I'm holding true to that. The dollar expanded higher interweek. We're not trying to predict the closing price on the week. I'm not trying to teach you or have your focus on knowing where that closing price is on the weekly candle. That's not what you're... Your, your job is not to do that. Your job is to anticipate the market gravitating towards a direction on that weekly chart, expanding higher on dollar and expanding lower on other markets. But the problem here is within your measuring of that tape that's going to be delivered over the day, over the course of the week, you have to consider also we are stuck in that range on the daily chart. Since essentially the first trading days of uh, February, we're stuck in a range bound environment. So when I give you that bias that I think is risk off, we're going to see what kind of market profile. Consolidation with Thursday or Friday expansion. Go back and look at the core content. Look at day trading section of the core content. For those that are really versed in keeping good notes with my concepts, or if you're a charter member and you know exactly what lessons and where to find it, what month should they look for for the 
daily and weekly templates. Those, those profiles that I teach in my core content. That's already on my YouTube channel, so you don't have to ask me for it. It's a consolidation week with our Thursday or Friday expansion. Now think about what I've talked to you about on Sunday. A higher dollar, but we're in a consolidation. So we have to wait for something to occur. It's, con it's going to be consolidation, yes. Yeah, it's going to be choppy, yes. Is it tradable? Yes, absolutely. I traded, other people traded it, it's fine. But we are con considering this big event coming into Tuesday, which was the CPI number. That's interesting, isn't it? Now, you see these folks out here, they're out here constantly running numbers. They're, con they're crunching numbers. There's a certain guru, and they're talking about me. There's a certain guru out there that says that when the markets make the high of the week or the low of the week, he says it's 70% of the time, it's on a Tuesday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not an every week profile that delivers a bias higher or lower. Sometimes there's weeks where it's expected to do nothing but go sideways. You can't factor that because if you do that, then you skew your output. And numbers like anything, if you torture them enough, they're going to confess to anything. That's what indicators do. They whip and torture data that's already happened that you can't make money on. And if you tinker with them long enough, the indicator will tell you what you want it to say. And I was victim to that. And that's all these authors ever do. They take something to form fit something that's worked in the chart in the hindsight. They did not do that shit live. Now you see me walking you forward on a one minute candle basis, calling every fucking candle exactly how it's going to happen. Now, there's no indicator in that. There's no retail thing that I'm leaning to. I'm talking about the candle that's forming based on the stuff that I talked about on Sunday before the market opened up. We're in range bound. We're expecting a move in the dollar. We're expecting weakness in other markets. But does it happen right from Jump Street? Does it happen, well, it's just going to be a straight decline? No, we have to be navigating through consolidating and choppiness. Looking for areas of what? Fair value. Well, what, do I, what am I supposed to focus on, Michael? There's two volume imbalances I told you to focus on from the daily chart on the ES. Told you to take those levels. In fact, you want to go back through that February 12th, and there's a lot of key levels that I talk about. I'll mention them in here for those that are lazy, but there's specific ones in there that I talk about. And it basically framed the whole entire week. Now, I leave that for those students when they see me talk about it. They have them on their charts. And then when they watch the end of the week, when it comes to conclusion, and they see, wow, the market did go up to that level. Wow, the market did go down to that level. And it didn't do anything else. <laughs> That's real harmonic. <laughs> That's the wave Elliot wants to wait, uh, ride on, right? He wants to hang 10 on that wave. Well, if you go through the market review on the February 12th, you're hearing me talk about how we're expecting, and I'm expecting specifically, the, the expansion higher on dollar. So that means it's going to be easy to find what? The sharp, big magnitude moves are going to be in what direction in ES? Down. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have rallies that are tradable that look decent when you're on a one or five minute basis. It's going to look dynamic because you're zeroed in. You only have three candles on one minute candlestick chart. You're so zoomed in. <laughs> you got to take some space and, and crunch it up and put more data on there. But you're going to see that these big sharp declines that we've seen in ES are in concert with what we were expecting on Sunday before the market even opened up. The market's going to gyrate back and forth all day, all week, all you know, that's going to happen, yes. But you want to know where there's conditions that's going to present range-bound, difficult times where we don't see these big trending days. Trending days are easy to 
to, to trade in. And you don't have a whole lot of opportunities to get in. It's just here's where you got you got to know to do it this this this, and if it starts running after that, it's it. It's over. You've missed it. You got to wait now for the next opportunity. But in range bound consolidations like we're in right now, you have to be nimble. Pick your shots. When it gets to your levels, you get out. Don't think that we're going to keep on tearing off higher or tearing off lower. It's going to be within a predetermined range. So what? What's the weekly profile? We'll go back and listen to the 12th of February. I tell you, it's going to be risk off, dollar higher, markets lower. So now let's take that one step further, Michael. Let's put further scrutiny behind all the things you said before. So what you're saying essentially is the market's going to go sideways, yes, but this has a lower tone behind that for markets being bearish and dollar higher. So while within all the context of a range-bound market over the course of the entirety of the week, we're essentially going to see the biggest move with the magnitude and speed that we like to look for as price action signatures is going to be in the expansion higher for dollar and lower for S&P, lower for euro, lower for cable, lower for all other assets. Okay, so if that's what we're expecting, Overall, if you take a step back and pull up a 15-minute time frame on any of your markets that you'd like to follow, we had what staring at us in the face on Tuesday? CPI. That was the that was the big it was the elephant in the room. Or in this case, it was the bull in the China shop. <laughs> it, it just went in there and wrecked everything. But did it do what it was designed to do? Let's take a closer look at that. On Tuesday. All of this was behind the backdrop of CPI, which is what mechanism? Manipulation. You're not trying to predict anything except for the volatility that's coming into the marketplace. Do not have high expectations on knowing anything specific about any key level holding this or that because CPI, FOMC, rate announcements, they can sometimes literally destroy even my best analysis concepts, because it's manual intervention. Manual intervention is within the scope of what I mentioned earlier at the beginning of this discussion, which is a black swan. You don't know when they're going to manually intervene. You don't know that. You don't know when a bank is going to come out and say, yeah, we're going to, uh, we're just going to do a surprise interest rate cut or hike. Oh, what? You don't think they can't do it? They can. They can go out and devalue a currency overnight. Boom. Gone. That's always risk. And we know that when we first come into this business, we're welcoming that uncertainty and you need to. Doesn't mean we want to see it happen, but you say as a trader, it's not likely to happen, but guess what? Shit happens. But if we're expecting consolidation, through all that consolidation, ultimately, the largest magnitude move is going to be dollar higher, all other markets lower. Oh. Well, if we look at the profiles that I teach and taught in 2017, that's when those videos were produced, the summer months of 2017. Now, that logic was with me in 1996. But I put it into students' hands in 2017. They're in those core concept modules and lectures on my YouTube channel. So we have a range-bound consolidation week with a Thursday or Friday expansion. Okay. What would that look like based on what I gave you on Sunday? A range-bound market. If we're going lower... So that means for S&P, if we're going lower because we're expecting risk off, that means the dollar is going to go higher. That means on Tuesday, CPI should do some kind of manipulation and create what for the dollar on Tuesday, the low of the week. What should that mean for S&P and Forex? It should be making what? The high of the week. Okay. 
When should the new move occur? Because if we don't trade the manipulation, we're waiting for what to occur? Thursday and Friday's expansion, lower for S&P and higher for what? Dollar. Look at your charts. Did it do it? Yes. Let's go further. Let's look at the Tuesday high. What's some ob observations there? Well, February 3rd of 2023, the daily WIC, consequent encouragement, it's a premium uh, WIC. Okay, if you, if you look at that, Tuesday's high just goes like one point, maybe a point and a quarter past that consequent encouragement of February 3rd, daily WIC. So the wick above that daily high on the 3rd of February, split that in half. Look at your high on Tuesday. Well, that's random. It also swept February 9th buy side liquidity. And it was all manipulated by what? CPI. Okay, let's flip it. Let's look at the other side of the weekly range. The low of the week. Look at January 30th, 2023. That candle, the mean threshold, it's a bullish order block. The level actually is 4057 and three quarters. So 4057.75. Just happens to be a level I've already talked about. Told you to have it in your chart. It purged the daily low on February 10th of 2023, which that low comes in at 4060. 0.75. Incidentally, the only discount array that I mentioned on the February 12th commentary was the 1st of February discount consequent encouragement 4067.25. So inside that range, that weekly range, what was the factors that you should have been paying close attention to. Go back to the daily chart. What did I talk about on the 12th of February? I said there's two volume imbalances there. You want to extend them throughout the entirety of the week, all the way through Friday. But Michael, I got all this shit on my chart. How am I supposed to see price? You're supposed to have different templates to do certain things. New week opening gaps. You're going to need a template just for that. You're going to have five of them on your chart at any one time. And if they're in close proximity to one another, it's going to be a lot on your chart. And then you're going to add what? You're going to add all your rectangles for fair value gaps. You're going to be, you'll have too many things. This is the reason why I use a notepad. I don't have all that shit on my charts. I have it in my notes. But you as a student learning this, You'll have to do what I did. How I did it was I had charts that I only kept for certain functions. The primary function for the new week opening gap, I have a chart that just simply has that on it. I have nothing else on it. And I refer to that intraday, intraweek. Whenever I need to reference something, if I want to check my, my notes, maybe I wrote a number down wrong. Maybe I you know, didn't annotate a specific level correctly. I'm constantly referring back. Okay, I'm making sure I'm double calibrating every one of my notes that this is exactly what it is. And I'm watching to see if price gravitates towards these new week opening gaps. The one you're in right now that starts tomorrow evening and Sunday, that's one. And then you're going to use last week's new week opening gap, the week before that, the week before that, and the week before that. There's five always on that chart. It doesn't mean you're limited to just that, but you have to have at least the last five. Why? Because I taught that you're going to see that overlap of every month, that shift in money flow that comes into the marketplace. By having those last rolling four and the one you're presently working with, you won't be surprised by anything. You'll see how it's gravitating towards it and gravitating away from it. And because if it hangs around that new week opening gap, we're in consolidation. When it moves sharply away from it, and your analysis is already calling for a big trending event, then you know you have confirmation. The thing that everybody's looking for with indicators. You don't need it. 
It's going to tell you in price. So if you look at the range of the weekly high and low, what was what was taking place throughout the entirety of the week? Pull up a 15 minute time frame with those daily volume imbalances. Don't you don't know which ones I'm talking about? Watch the 12th of February's analysis. When it gets to uh, the S and P, you'll see there's. I don't draw them on the chart for you. I tell you where they are, and then you draw them out. I have usually I just draw it with a rectangle and extend it through. I will show you on Monday. I'm not going to be trading on Monday. It's a bank holiday, and it will be a pre-recorded lecture. So that's when you'll see my next, I guess, soiree with talking about the markets. So there won't be a live session on Monday. There won't be anything except for a pre-recorded lecture that I'll probably do sometime in the morning. I'll have it up by hopefully 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's the next installment for the mentorship here. But before I show you that, I want you to take a look at your own chart and show where that where that volume imbalances are. There's two of them. Extend them through your chart and look at it over the course of the entire week with a 15-minute time frame. What observations do you see there? Notice all of the intraday and intra-week imbalances all cluster within those two volume imbalances on the daily chart. See how that's creating a lot more of what we've seen on the daily chart. Just spotty price action. Spotty meaning it's creating these little inefficiencies or gaps created at the new day opening. You can really appreciate it if you have your 15 minute time frame chart showing those two daily volume imbalances that I refer to in the February 12th, 2023. See this, this type of lecture here. For some of you, it's just like, ugh, I can't follow this because you're lazy. You didn't write down and draw into your charts the things I'm talking about when I do the analysis. You're not even doing it right. And this is exactly what happened when I had paid students. Paid students. I would sit down and tell them exactly what I just told everybody for free, openly and publicly. They didn't take notes. They didn't record the levels in their charts. They didn't stay with the bias I was giving them. They were doing opposite to that, and they bitch and complain, say it's a scam, and they run off and quit. That's on you. That's not what I've taught, and you're, you're doing the very opposite of whatever it is I'm telling you to do. And your results are going to be what? Fucked. So don't do that. So if you take that 15-minute time frame, and you have those daily volume imbalances, I annotate and show you exactly with my cursor. I'm not drawing them on my chart because I want you to do them on yours. If you want to use horizontal trend lines to annotate the volume of balance, okay. If you want to use the rectangle, okay. It's a preference. Your annotation style is going to be your annotation style. Your colors, all that stuff, it's going to be yours. Don't, don't try to mimic everything or use my charts. You're not going to learn the same. You'll learn to do it by doing it yourself. But if you take your 15-minute time frame, Show the entirety of Sunday's opening to Friday's close. That's how much range of price data you have to have on your chart. Have those daily volume imbalances highlighted on your 15-minute time frame. And then toggle in the lower right-hand corner on TradingView. Go from, it usually will be toggled by default with ETH, which is electronic trading hours. You want to toggle that and trade it to, I'm sorry, switch it to RTH, regular trading hours. And when you toggle that, you're going to see all the new day, new day gap more or less converge within those two volume imbalances, majority of the week. You're seeing visually why markets consolidate. What's the mechanism behind why they are consolidating? It's creating these gaps, these inefficiencies that he that has to keep coming back to reprice to. Because there is no overwhelming pool of liquidity above or below the marketplace to inspire price to go outside of it. There's too many of them near term all around in this big cluster that's being shown on the daily chart for the entire time we've been trading in February. 
So there's no reason for price to go explore outside that boundary yet. Why? Because they're holding price where it's at right now. It's at a point where it can go either direction, which is why I said we're going to have a consolidation market. It can go higher and it can go lower. That's 50-50, right? On a higher time frame basis, it's 50-50, yes. But on an intraday and an intra-week basis, we can still frame an, uh, a bias. I gave it to you on Sunday. We're going to range bound, yes, but I do believe that the dollar is going to expand higher and S&P and foreign currencies and other markets will go lower. All of those imbalances throughout the entirety of the week that you've been seeing on regular trading hours on a 15-minute basis, all are occurring within those two daily volume imbalances. Let's go one step further. It looks like a mess, doesn't it? I mean, look at your chart right now if you've done what I just asked ask you to do. It's like, man, look at this mess. How could anybody decipher any of this? This is just madness. It's chaos. I'm at, I'm at my wit's end, Michael. This is too much now. It's just, I can't see anything in all this. <laughs> Go into Thursday. Okay? On your 15-minute time frame, make sure your charts are toggled to regular trading hours now. That way you can see that gap lower on Thursday that I talked about how we were going to trade back up into. And I said that we were not likely to trade all the way back up to the previous closing price. On your 15-minute time frame, while regular trading hours is toggled, not electronic trading hours, and again, you, you toggle that on trading view in the lower right-hand corner. If you look at the Thursday gap, we gap lower. Look at the bearish breaker that can be seen on Wednesday, February 15th. And if you're using a 15-minute candlestick chart, the time candle is going to be 14 colon 45 and your chart must be set to New York time. If you're doing anything other than if you're looking at in your local time, you're not going to find what I'm talking about. Everything that I teach your charts and trading view must be New York local time. But if you look at the February 15th, which is Wednesday's bearish breaker on a 15 minute candle, the candle itself is at the timestamp of 14 colon 45. Notice that how price, when it came back up into the gap that was formed at the New York session opening gap at 9.30, the difference is where we traded and closed the previous session. And we're at 9.30 opening. You're going to be doing this every day as a day trader in index futures. You do this every single day. You're going to toggle real trading hours from electronic trading hours. Because that gap, the difference between the previous session close and the new session opening at 9.30. Yes, we traded all night long. Yes, it's, it's really going on. It's, it's, it's being traded back and forth. Yes. But the premium or discount of that gap relative to where we closed the previous session. What do, what do I mean by that? Are you talking about the PDA rate matrix? No. The term is we're opening up with a premium if the gap is higher than previous session close. We're opening up at a discount if it's lower than we were closed in the previous session. So on Thursday, we opened where? Down. We were in a deep, deep discount. So it trades up to what? The previous session closed? No, it doesn't need to. Well, how do you know when it's not going to do that, Michael? 15-minute time frame. Bearish breaker. 1445 candle, February 15th. Okay, note that. Also, if you've done what I told you to do by taking that volume and balance and extending it through the entirety of the week, on your 15 minute candlestick, on February 16th, the candle, 12 colon 45. Okay, so 1245 candle on a 15 minute time frame. That high tick is the high tick of your daily volume imbalance. At 14 colon 30, that high 
1430 high is the high tick of that candle. And it's also the high tick of that daily volume imbalance. What happened after that? Free fall. Nothing's random. There is no chaos. It just looks unfamiliar right now. Everything I told you on the 12th of, in terms of key levels, what to look for, what to watch, it's in your chart right now. The method of how price would deliver over the entirety of the week is exactly what your chart shows right now. Dollar went higher. Markets went lower. We had to deal and contend with what? Consolidation. CPI did the very manipulation that sets the tone for what? If it's going to be a consolidation with a lower market and higher dollar, that means in simplest terms, Tuesday's the event with, I'm sorry, with manipulation, and then it's going to be providing what? Tuesday low of the week for dollar, Tuesday high of the week for other markets. Thumb in the eye to all these number crunchers. Oh, it's, it's, it's not true what he says. No, it's absolutely fucking true what I say. I'm out here walking it. I'm proving it to you. You're looking at it. I'm calling it in every one minute candle that you can't fake it. There's no way of faking that. And you're seeing how wonderfully predictable price can be. Not all the time. Not all the time. There's certain things we have to wait for. But once it shows me what I'm looking for, it's on a leash now. And we're going to walk it right to where I say it's going to go. Don't believe me? Keep showing up every day. Keep showing up every fucking day. And you will get what you came here for. Proof, evidence, skill set, and the confidence to be able to do this at the end of the year when I'm no longer doing it. You don't need to worry about what I'm not going to be doing. What I'm doing right now is what you need to be focusing on. Because this is where you learn to build these muscles up on your own. Working out with us together, training your eye to see these things in price action, real time. Not, oh, it's already happened. Let's talk about it. Cherry picking hindsight stuff. That's not what we're doing here. So we have had, in my opinion, in closing here, we've had a very fruitful week in terms of learning. We had some pretty impactful events within price action that we observed real time. The weekly consequent encroachment levels that I gave you also uh, for two, the last two weeks, I told you when we were on the February 12th level, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the February 12th review on YouTube channel uh, content. I mentioned that the uh, 4178.25 level and 4161.25, they were key levels to have them also on your chart. Now, I counsel you to go look at your charts and see how that was impactful to price action. That was the only thing on my notes I didn't touch on. I apologize. But apart from that, we had fun this week. We had a learning experience. It's fun to get in there and have these little laboratory experiments with price action. Does it do these things that we're looking for? Does it do this that we're looking for? Does it hold true? And right now, you're all seeing it. And I've had students for years that paid me. And when they watched this happen every single week, every single day. And that's why you never saw them come out in public and complain and say I was a fraud that I wasn't doing it in front of them every single fucking day, every single week. Now you're seeing it more so than they did. I'm doing it on a one minute candlestick chart. And yes, there might be a 20 to 30 second delay in the live stream, but guess what? Once I talk and the live stream is projecting it out into the internet and you receive it, I can't call it back. I can't change my opinion about what I said was going to happen or wasn't going to happen. I'm out here, no safety net. This week, I had a live stream killed. You watch my battery thing pop up and say, okay, low charge. All I did was plug it, plug it in. 
I don't know why my live stream was cut. And I don't know why when I tried to start a new live stream, even rebooting, it would not start another one. So it just might be one of those instances where, you know, it's just a connection issue. That's fine. But if it happens again, <laughs> I'm going to take that as uh, shut the fuck up. OK, and I'm just going to put that out there so that way I know and you all know now I'll have to change my delivery method. But it's pretty uncanny how we're out here and every single individual woman at Candles dancing to the tune I'm playing. We're watching and observing price action. And until it tips its hand, I'm taking your attention on both premium and discount arrays. Yes, that's absolutely what's going on because I need you to observe that moment, that shift in market structure when things become absolutely clear. When did that happen? When I've talked about those breakers, I told you how to go into that breaker and the levels where the body's going to respect it and the wicks can go this far. And it went where we were looking for it to go. You can't fake that. You can't make up shit as you go in a one minute candlestick chart. There's, there's no way. And for the folks that are doing mentorships, that are teaching you and you're paying them. Ask them to do this. Because if they know my smart money concepts, if they know how to trade, if they know how to read price, if they know how to do that stuff, they say they can do. They will gladly do what I'm doing and they will be just as precise. But they're not going to be able to do that. They're not going to be able to do that for you. They're going to give you excuses as why they can't. If they have figured out Enigma, they'll do what I'm doing right now. But they won't. They'll have yin and yang symbols on their fucking chart and showing $15,000 max loss days. And kill their stream before their trades go to shit. I'm going to save this and I'm going to close. There's a lot of YouTubers out there. That might be a little intimidated. Because when I'm doing my live streams, there's a little bit more people watching me. I'm not competing against you. Okay, I'm not going to get on air and call you by name and talk about how you're not a good trader or you're foolish or this shit don't work that you're using. I'm not going to do that. That's, that's, I'm not trying to be that person. I'm not trying to compete with any of you. All I'm trying to do is make a medium for those that are interested, that want to see. You're able to see my thoughts. My expectations, the way I read tea leaves of these market fluctuations, I will get it wrong, folks. Something will happen where I get it wrong. And you're not going to hear me piss and moan. You're not going to hear me gasp. I'm not going to go into a fucking tyrant and tell, oh, you know, this bullshit. It's just I did it wrong. That's OK. Take a step back, reevaluate what's going on. You need to experience that. That's the only reason why I changed my mind about doing it two times a week to down every fucking day. I'm going to make sure I'm in front of the charts where I read it wrong. You need to experience that. You need to see me in the frailty of my humanity do it incorrectly, where I bring in my gut and feelings about what it is I'm expecting because I've done it so long. And I try to finesse something that I know, if I was being honest, right there on the, on the fly, my logic says to do this. But because I've been here so many other times, I'm a human. You're going to have that shit happen to you as a trader, too. That happens, folks. You can be as rigid as you want to be. You're going to have all the rules, all the things that you're supposed to do. But you know damn well that sign said 55 fucking miles an hour. Don't go one mile an hour over it. But you think that you can do nine because the unwritten rule is, well, as long as you don't do 10 miles an hour over, they won't pull you over. What the fuck? You're still breaking the law, right? So it's no different with trading. 
you're going to do the same shit. Whenever you get that little itch to push the acceleration pedal down, when you're not supposed to do so, you're going to be rewarded with pain. You're going to be rewarded with an adverse reaction. And you will see me do that right in front of you. And there's no reason to be afraid of that. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it. So if I'm teaching you and I'm not afraid of it and I know it's going to happen. And once I do it, you've already seen me take a loss last week. You came right back up boom, like it never even happened. The things that you're fearful of, they're nothing. It's all what if thinking. What if it does this? What if it doesn't do the shit you're afraid of? You've wasted fucking time. You wasted opportunity. What if? What if this and what if that? What if everything I've been saying all these fucking years is exactly what I've been proving now out here in front of everybody? How much time did you waste now? And you're still some of you. But what if, but what if, what if you got off your ass and started training with us every day? What if you did the things I told you to focus on and don't focus on the shit I told you not to focus on? If you did that, what if you did that? <laughs> I know I did all that same silly shit too. You procrastinate because you're afraid. Okay. What are you more fearful of? Are you more fearful of losing your job and not being able to pay for groceries and meeting your ends because shit's about to go upside down? Or are you fearful of while learning when it's normal to make mistakes, where it's safe to make mistakes, when you're not even trading with real money or even a demo, that you can afford to be wrong while you're learning? No ego, no pressure, no pride. Nobody looking at what you're doing in private to be able to laugh at you because you're not going to take your results while you're learning to the social media spectrum. There's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. I'm doing everything I can humanly within the scope of reasonable and beyond that to help you get this. I'm hoping I have enough time to get through what I want to get through by the end of the year. But the way the things are unfolding around us, I might not be able to. What do I mean by that? Shit's breaking out all the time. It's hard shit going on right now. And just pay attention. Everything I told you that was going to happen, and for those that were in my private group, you've known this now for two years or more. I told you what's happening. And what's coming, it's all happening. In live sessions and in, in Twitter spaces, I told everyone, you get your ass ready because it's it's coming. Remember, I told you you had 18 months. We're coming down the wire, folks. You have to get your house ready. You have to. Because what they got in store for all of us and I'm not exempt the money I have it's a lot but they can push a button and then boom I have nothing nothing there's no safe haven places there's no where are you going to put your money in I don't fucking know so while you can you stay busy learning skill sets like this one we may have a period where the market's not allowed to be traded. Something might happen that causes access to the markets to be interrupted for a period of time. Oh, that can't happen. That's bullshit. Well, guess what? On 9-11, it fucking did. All they need is the reason to do it. That's all. Just the reason that would be Globally accepted as, oh, well, it makes sense why we can't trade right now because look what happened. What's going to happen? I don't know. But I know we're coming down to the wire. Do I have time? Why, why would I even bother doing this? I might be wrong. And you don't have the skill set and another stream of income that can come from this. 
It's not guaranteed to any of you. But the measure of the tape is going to reach farther for some and fall short for others. And it's all going to be based on how much time and effort and energy you pour into it. And here's my thought process. Even if you get halfway to where you hope you get, one quarter of where you want to be from having all this information and understood and skill set from doing it, that's far better than sitting around paranoid because of what's about to happen, how everything's going to be expensive or not be able to be obtained. How much do eggs cost for you now? Mm -hmm. I said that was going to happen. You like meat? You like eating steaks? <laughs> it's going to get real fucking expensive in the next nine months. Real, real expensive. But guess what that means? It's hardship for most. Yes. But guess what that means? We have cattle futures that we can trade. Ooh. So it allows you to channel what would otherwise be viewed as stress, anxiety, panic in the average person. And that sticker shock when you go to the grocery store you're feeling right now. When you can pull out an extra thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a month in trading. Notice I said that, not a fucking Lamborghini. Not a fucking Ferrari. Not a $2 million house like ICT. A $1,500, $1,000 bump each month. If that's all you got, how many people do you know that are never going to get that? How much better are you off than them? I'm sure on your, in one hand you can list five friends that you know that if you did that, you'd be better than them. And it's not about being better than a person, but in a position financially to be able to weather it. If I can be honest for a moment, and then I'm going to stop because I'm already talking about shit on this that I, I didn't want to talk about again. <sighs> What's my expectation? What's my goal? Why the fuck am I doing this? Because I keep asking, why am I? You know, I see people asking me, why are you doing this? First of all, let's get one thing straight. I could write a fucking check to myself in the amount of millions of dollars every single month again if I wanted it. I don't want it. I could be charging you all money. I don't want it. And I swear to Christ Almighty, I'm never, ever, 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 ever charging for a mentorship ever again. I'm never doing it. I'm never doing it. It's February 18th, 2023. Michael Huddleston will absolutely never charge for a mentorship ever again. It's never going to happen. So why am I doing it? I have had this information for almost 25 years. You're not supposed to know it. I wasn't supposed to share it. And I had a case of the ass one day because I was told you can't do something. So I've told you many times facetiously that it's human nature for someone to see the sign that says, don't touch wet paint. Don't walk on the grass. Well, I was that kid as a, as a little one. I was quiet, but I always wrote my initials on the desks at school, wet paint, I'd pick my finger in the cement that was just poured and put my initials in the year. I didn't mean anything mean by it. It's just, that was my human nature to don't do this. Okay, I'm doing that. That's what we all are. We're sinners. We do the things we're not supposed to do. Don't walk on the grass. I'm fucking moonwalking on it. So when I'm told, you can't use this. 
I can't use it. The fuck you mean I can't use it? You cannot use it. Oh. Is that so? Well, what happens if I come out publicly with something that is real, real, real close to it? Much like Pepsi is to Coke. I'm not really sharing the recipe for Coca-Cola. But it looks just like it does in a glass. It has the same effervescence. Gives you the same sugar high. But the ingredients are not exactly the same. So when I'm not allowed to sit at the card table because they know I know how to count cards. I've spent years documenting a reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. And nobody that said, don't walk on the grass. Don't touch the wet paint can say, I used that. Can my life be made difficult still? Sure, it could be. It's always being threatened all the time. But you're all benefiting from something that my hand's been in. And I'm proving that. What difference does it make? Who gives a shit? I do. And unfortunately, for those that don't like to hear about it, I drag you across it, not because I take pleasure in that. It's just I constantly have to remind myself. I do have boundaries. And I don't like the fact that I have boundaries. And I like to press into them as much as I can. Sometimes, too much. I wish I could talk more openly. I wish I could say everything that I want to say. But I have to be measured, calculated. And when I take a deep breath before I start talking, I'm making sure I don't lose control and go off the rails and say more than I'm supposed to. The opinions of others that listen to me, it's really not that big of a deal to me. It's me laying down a logic of what I'm using, when I'm using it, and because I've made it public, that's as far as I can let the cat out of the bag. Do I have something that is outside of retail stuff? At this point, Any reasonable person can look at that and say yes. Does it go further than this? Absolutely. Do you need all that? No. So why am I doing all this for free? Why am I pouring myself into it like this? Number one, it's been asked of me many times from all of you. And I'd be lying if I said that when I came home and the summer months of 2016. We had come back from the beach. We spent a week. And I got all these emails from people saying there's a lot of people in the Middle East that are selling your free videos off your YouTube channel. Just They're just selling them. And you know me now because of being in these Twitter spaces. I'm bipolar. And it's very difficult for me to control myself. Once I've 
flip the switch inside. Not that I want to, but when it happens, I start running. And sometimes it's ugly things that come out of my mouth. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's funny stuff. And sometimes I wish I could go back and erase that from history because it's, I'm not in control of myself. So while I've never been drunk, I've never been out of my mind because of drugs. To me, I look at it, it's equivalent to that. And I got pissed off. I got mad. And I did the very thing I said I would never, ever do. And I went on on Twitter and I said, here, you motherfuckers are never going to get anything ever for free anymore. You want to learn from me? This is it. 150 bucks. Now, looking back, I was stupid because I was thinking, you know, I'm punishing them. How the hell am I, how am I punishing them? The only thing I did was, hey, hey, look, pay me $150. I'm going to give you some really good shit so they can sell that too. And that's exactly what they did. My shit was leaked all over the place. It was in Telegram channels. It was in Discord rooms. It was on Google Drives. It was on flash drives being sold hand-to-hand at bus stops. <laughs> it was the new crack. It still is. I got the Heisenberg shit. I mean, this is the real shit. Everybody wants this. That's cool. But all the time I was spending and doing all that stuff, making all the lectures and putting up with everybody's personalities and character flaws and impatience. It was just me doing it. Me, just me answering the questions, producing the videos and editing and everything else. It's, it was hard. It was hard to do all that shit. And I wished I hadn't done it that way. And then I had a audience member say, you know, would you ever let anybody else come in? Because I have a cousin, I have a brother, I have a sister, I have a this, I have a that. And they would come in with these requests. And I was like, Ugh, I'll do one more enrollment. I'll do one more enrollment. And every year when I wanted to stop, it just was like bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and produced more work for me. Then I had to stop the 2021 group. That was it. A lot of young folks that came in, no, no discipline, no respect, no couth, courtesy, just, you know, what I'm talking about young, young folks. And I was a young folk at one time. I was an asshole, a prick, arrogant little asshole. And I had a lot of those come into the 2021 mentorship. And a lot of them are running mentorships right now, <laughs> teaching my shit. And they're the ones that I blocked. And they talk shit about me now and they still can't keep up. When I went through that mentorship and I was looking for a way where I could feel satisfied and say, okay, I'm, I'm content. I'm done with this. I had a lot of people constantly emailing and they still do. Can I join your private group? No. I'm going to tell you something honestly, okay? This is the God's honest truth, and everybody that's in my private mentorship can come out and say, I'm lying if I am. Right now, the only thing they're getting from me is the opportunity to ask questions where you don't. When I present something, you get it the way I give it to you, and there's nothing extra. That's it. When I produce a lecture, I give them a medium and I say, if you have questions about what I did here, you can ask me and I will answer their questions. That's what they're, that's the group. I've already taught everything on those core videos that's on my YouTube channel. They watched me do that live. That was what they paid for, that experience, that, that exposure to it before it happens. The lectures, being a part of that community. When I'm teaching, I'm teaching publicly. That way no one can sell it and steal it and say, here, I got something cool. Here's ICT's videos. I don't produce videos for that private group anymore. I haven't done so in years. 
Oh, and that's not probably true. It's about about over a year or so. I give them a community place for them to talk with me and ask me questions and talk with other members. That's what that is. There is no way to join that. So why am I doing this? Because I know what's about to happen. I've known it for a while. When I stepped out on Baby Pips, 2010, I was reading a lot of people on there talking like they knew what they're talking about and they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And I was afraid to come out and talk about these things. I was afraid. I ain't going to deny it. I mean, I was fucking afraid. Not because of being judged by the public. <laughs> it's not what I came out and wore the demo badge forever. And I coined that term demo baller. That's who I was. So what's anybody going to say about me? Nothing. I came out publicly and said, I'm doing this with a demo, but I'm doing it 50 times better than you. And you're selling shit. Pretending to be something elite. Lamborghinis and BMWs. <laughs> but you ain't showing your trades getting in and out, are you? And that's what people saw when they joined my mentorship before. What you're seeing right now, little recordings of me doing examples of trades. And now you have the benefit of doing what? Seeing why I've done those trades. So after I closed that private group down, I had a lot of people reach out to me and say, hey, look, you know, you're an asshole because you won't let me join. You're being selfish. You're a jerk. You won't let other people do. You did it this many times, but you stopped now. And I know there was a lot of people that couldn't afford to keep up with the payments. And I knew there's a lot of people that could have never done it at all. I had folks from Africa jo joined up 25 deep per account. That means there was 25 people chipping in just to make that one monthly payment each month. I didn't know that at the time. But that's how most of that shit got on Telegram. One family member got greedy and tried to sell it. And then it got leaked and got leaked and got leaked and got leaked. That's how it happened. So I had all these folks reach out to me and put a heavy heaviness on me. And that took me back to when I was on Baby Pips. When I first stepped out there, the very first post I ever made, what every new and aspiring Forex trader wants to know. I had that thing typed out for like a week before I put it up, edited it, added things, took things away. <laughs> and I was afraid. Like I was afraid to start it all. Knowing me, once I started something, it would just go on and on. And then I would just eventually get to the point where I knew I shared too much. And then the ramifications of all that stuff, I'd have to deal with it. So when I had a lot of folks all around the world reach out to me and you see it still in my comments and when I comment on other people's videos, hey, can you do one more mentorship? Folks, listen, I'm doing it right here. This is my last time. I believe my family is going to need me and I'm going to need them. It's going to get hard going to get real real hard and having a lot of money is not something that makes one exempt because money will be attacked so i'm doing this because i want a clear conscience i don't want to have to answer to you could have did this much more and help this many more if you would have done it this way. And I felt like I was being directed to do this. You can call it conscience. You can call it just guilt. You can call it 
attention seeking, you can call it whatever you want to call it. I'm doing what I feel in my heart I should do. No matter how many people find success or fail in it, no one's going to be able to say I did it half-assed. No one's going to say that I held anything back. No one's going to say that I didn't pour myself into it. And I'm going to have a clear conscience when I tell you the second Friday in November this year, should we get to that point? Because something could happen. I'm like, you know, tomorrow's not promising no man. But what happens when we get to that point? What are my hopes? My hopes are this, that you will have found a way to get out of your own way. Stop hindering your progress. Stop having lofty expectations of yourself and, and or trading. Be realistic with it. Go back and watch that end series. That's how I started on Baby Pips. I wanted you to think responsibly about money, how to earn it, and how to use speculation. Not get rich quick. I've never promoted get rich quick, ever. I've never, ever, ever done that shit. And anybody that gets out there and flashes that pomp stuff, look, folks, I have the real shit. I have it. I have all that money. I have all those fucking toys. I can go out and buy a Lamborghini every fucking day of the week. I can do that. I can live stream that shit. I can go out there and show you the fucking receipts. Here it is. There's no fucking lease payment, and I don't lease a fucking car now at all. All my shit's for real. You're seeing Photoshop shit. 2019 was a lease until it was paid off, and I still own it. It's in my garage. I don't like Lamborghinis. They're shit. I like American muscle. And while I'm talking about it, I took a Hellcat jailbreak edition. They had extra work done to it. Um, I took it out the other day. They, they have a $50,000 markup on this fucker, which is insane. It's already, it's too stupidly expensive as it is, but they're not making them anymore. So I've been wrestling with it and the dealer keeps calling me up saying, look, how can we do a deal? How can we do a deal? <laughs> we got to come off that 50000 because that just doesn't make any damn sense. I mean, I wasted a lot of money, lots of money over my lifetime on cars. But uh, I know having that car, I'm buying it to not drive it, which makes no fucking sense, right? Well, you know, I, I drive my Corvettes. I drive every car that I own. And so if you're going to invest money in something like that, you know, I, I just don't have the disposition to do it. Like, I'm not a collector in that respect. I'm not a Jay Leno, buy a car and put it in a fucking room and don't touch it. No, that's not me. So I've been wrestling with that. Nobody's going to be paying no $138,000 for that car. So, but they're trying to argue and say the owners just watched someone buy it at an auction for 210000 If that's the case, then you would be selling your shit for 190000 not 138000 So, it's all bullshit. I don't know how I got on that topic, but I want you all to be able to take what I'm sharing. Formulate an approach that's unique to you, that matches your disposition, your personality, not chasing money, not chasing wealth, not chasing clout, but to be able to make your ends meet or at least alleviate some, if not most, of the added increase that we're all going to experience. When I go to the grocery store, I buy groceries for four people and two dogs. And my grocery bill is anywhere between a low end $800 to $1,500 a month. Now that might not be equivalent to you. It may be less. It may be more, but I can tell you, I wasn't spending that two years ago. So I thought to myself around the fall of the last year, I was thinking to myself, you know, what can I do to live with myself? To know that I've done everything that I could have done to make this accessible to all of you. To show you how to do it properly, to walk you through it, to show it to you real time what it looks like in the charts. 
and remove all the bullshit that these assholes out there claim that they know about me, what I really look like. What I, you all see what I look like. I showed myself on corpse interview. That's me. You seen me without my facial hair when I was driving my Corvette, did a little short thing on uh, YouTube. That's what I look like. Does that make you more money knowing what I look like? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. If I show you my cars, if I go out and buy that jailbreak edition, does it make you more money? No. I've lived my life the way I want to live my life. I don't try to live my life in front of all of you. I don't have an interest in doing that. There is a narrative that I want to use because it'll help me write off and depreciate the motorhome that I have. So I will be doing a, a like a private, not a private, but a, a separate playlist of uh, like a digital nomad. That's what I'm going to call it. That playlist will be digital nomad where I'm taking our RV out to different locations this year. And because I will be trading, you'll see me over the shoulders. I'm trading and I'm in the RV. So that allows me to write that off because it's a series for me to do what? Collect ad revenue on YouTube with that series, which allows me to do what? Legally depreciate that RV, which I paid nearly $300,000 for. I don't just do things on a whim. I'm doing things that make sense. Now, anybody else that goes out and buys an RV, you eat it. It's the way it is. But if I show something, it's part of my sitcom, my presentation, my YouTube channel. It's a element that is part. It's integral to what it is I'm doing. Digital nomad. I'm a traveling around the world trader. And here I am trading the S&P. We're in Arizona right now. We're in Utah. We're in Montana, which I can't wait to go up to. And I think I've already told some of you why. But because I'm doing that and I'm running a business with it, it allows me to do what? Legally depreciate it. Whereas if you tried to do that and you don't have a business, they are be like, what the hell are you trying to do that for? You can't do that. <laughs> you can't do it. So there's a way to be a master over money or, which is what we're trained to be in school, a slave to money. I want you all to be able to do what you can within your own limitations that you hold right now that will be expanded over time. Through growing pains, you'll be able to do more than you'll be able to do when you first start doing this. But my hopes and prayers are that I have completed this year in a way where I've impacted your life, inspired you to make better changes, decisions about what you do with money and how to pursue it, and hopefully created a vehicle for you to go in and explore the opportunity for you to find that in this. I can't promise it to you. I wish I could. I would. If it could be easier or shown to you in a real straightforward one, two, three, easy, I would do it. God knows it's my wish and prayer for you to be able to do this. And I want to stop when I'm done. That way, you know, I'm not leading you on to some keep paying me ad revenue. Keep doing this and keep doing that. I don't I don't want that. If it was about money, I would be putting up a PayPal link saying, here, pay me. And look how many people follow me right now. If just 20% started paying me, I'd be back to making millions of dollars again a month. It's not about that. I'm already rich. I don't need more money. I don't need to do it. I don't ever need to take a trade ever again the rest of my life, ever, ever. Everything I own is owned. I don't rent. I don't lease. I don't do shit. It's all lock, stock, and barrel mine. And I'm proving to you that I'm not motivated by attention or 
people paying me monthly subscriptions. I don't need that. So when you come to me and you're listening to me, there's no ulterior motive. There's no upsell coming. And the easiest way for me, to, in my mind, I was thinking, how can I prove that there's no reason not to trust me? And what I'm saying and what I'm teaching you in the marketplace is do it for free. Do it publicly. Do it live streamed. Do it every single day and ask nothing in return. And that's why I'm doing it. I might not be successful. There may be some of you that I don't reach, that you can't do it. And in certain respects, I guess in some ways, you can say I failed being able to teach for every person, but I'm trying my best. I'm doing, I'm, I've never claimed to be the best mentor. I'm the mentor of every mentor out there teaching this shit. But I'm not the best mentor. I'm not the best. I'm not upset about that. I know there's limitations to me. But I'm doing everything I can to make this obtainable for you. And frankly, since I've started, every night when I lay my head down, I have went to sleep peacefully. Thankfully, I don't have anything in my heart that feels regretful. I don't feel like I have lived my entire life where I know things that the general public would never know. And there's many times I've been in situations I've watched other people hurt themselves in these markets. And I know how that can be prevented. And it haunts me because I, I can't. I can't fix everyone and I can't bring those people back. And some of them are friends. And I was afraid to tell them. What are you afraid of? Being able to see my family and them see me. Breathe. So it takes a whole lot of effort for me to create a language present it where it is far enough away but for someone that knows it they can recognize it and it has nothing to do with anything retail. Nothing. And when I'm done this year, I won't be feeling like I have more to do to not feel a guilt-free life. You're not entitled to this information. I'm not obligated to teach it. But I made a promise. And I feel like this is the best way for me to fulfill that. I mean, if anybody has odds against me after this, whatever. I, I'm not, can't, I can't connect with everyone. Some of you have a issue with me because I'm doing this and you try to sell something. So you want to vilif vilif vilify me on that, exaggerate shit, make up things, doctor my actual image, say things that are not true about me and my family. All because you can't be at this level. When my disposition and my character is, I want to help everyone, even other people that do this and sell things and try to make a business for themselves. I 
I could be a selfish dick and keep growing in my community and never reach out to other people. But if you look at what I do, I reach out to other YouTubers, other traders, other people that are starting up their own little thing. And I bump them because that's my nature. I do that. That's who I am. I'm not a villain. I'm not an asshole that goes around with a club beating everybody, everybody the head saying, you know, you're trash. You, you, you can't do this. You can't do that. I've been blessed with a wonderfully, wonderfully supportive community. Some of you are just overzealous and you want to treat it like it's a football team. And we're not the Pittsburgh Steelers. Okay. We, we, you know, we're not the terrible towel swinging, you know, <laughs> I think I got that right. I'm not a football fan. I'm probably going to embarrass myself here because I don't know sports well, but I know there's, you know, I think it's the Pittsburgh Steelers, Pittsburgh Steelers. I think, yeah, I know it's, the, it's Steelers, but the, um, they have this towel. They swing around in the, in the audience, in the, in the stadium and they start screaming and stuff. <laughs> it's, I don't understand it, but, some of my students feel like that's what it's like, or like they're one of the 300, you know, the Spartans. You know, they got to go out there and you know, do war with people. That's not what this is, man. It's not what it is. But I've been blessed with such a huge community that just keeps growing. Like I got 20,000 followers on Twitter, and I, I don't even know how it happened. Like in a very short time, it just, boom, they were there. More. 243,000 on Twitter. And I'm just a little bit below a half a million subscribers on YouTube. I'm intimidated by that. Like I am, I'm nervous because I don't, I, I'm, I know there's a lot of people listening, but when there's a number attached to that, like that, it's very intimidating. I mean, you hear me talk about the markets when I'm dialed in and I'm, distracted by how the numbers and ears and listening to me. I don't want to see that chat window. I don't want to know. I don't never know how many people are listening to my live streams or in this. Like, I don't know how many people are listening because if I, if I see that I'll choke, it'll, it'll become a impediment for me to be able to talk openly and freely and, and be me because I'm still that kid. From Middle River. That will never have. The pleasure. The sense of accomplishment. To hear the man that he loved. Tell him. You've done good. And as many times as I hear from all of you, and I appreciate it, it doesn't satisfy. So when I do these things, the scratch and itch that I can't ever satisfy. And I, I guess in many ways, I'll continue doing it until I don't have my mental faculties. Or here. It's a pursuit of something that I'm never going to obtain, and I know it. But that's the passion and the drive behind me. That's why I do it. I like to think that he can look down and see me. The first half of my life, I lived very selfishly. And seeing many of you through this medium of the internet coming in contact with so many of you, it changed me. When I was a 20 year old, knowing this stuff makes you feel immortal. Arrogance. 
pride. Then we get older and you have a family and you lose family members. You lose children. That stuff weighs on you and your view about how you keep score in life changes. It's not about how much money you make and how much you have in the bank. It's the relationships. How you impact other people and how you lead them. And I want to be able to know that I've done as much as I can within the scope of my capabilities because I don't claim to know how to teach the best way. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I've prayed all the time for the gift of teaching, for the patience to do it. And you can hear I am wrestling with real things that a human being in a better position mentally because I can't fight these imbalances. I can't correct them. And I will never take medicine for it. I will not. To me, it's not medicine. It's changing who you are by taking that. And I don't want to be anybody but me. That's why I don't drink. I don't get drunk. I don't take drugs. I'm lucid all the time. I wish I would have had the courage to come out and tell you in the beginning why I'd only do things recorded. Because I know what it feels like for me to live like this, 50 years old, and a thousand thoughts in my head all the time. And when I was younger, it was all violent thoughts. You would look at me and think, wow, this, this boy's quiet. He's so pleasant. He's well-mannered. But I had homicidal thoughts in my head all the time because I didn't want to be where I was. I felt uncomfortable, claustrophobic, pressure, anxious, not knowing that they were chemical imbalances. And how do you articulate that as a kid? You don't know how to. So you stay quiet and you say nothing. And over time, too much shit, I have to start talking. And that's why I can talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And it's better for me to talk. Because if it stays inside of me, it bottles up. And then it comes out later on with a family member that didn't ask for it. Why do you do these Twitter spaces, it's therapy. Frankly, I don't give a fuck if you like what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't care. It's letting me get rid of it. These aren't for my children. But when I make videos, they are. Here, it's just an outlet. And if I can help in the process, if you can see past my poor choice of language sometimes, and you can get something from it, all the better. If you don't get anything from them, don't listen to them. If you're offended by them, don't listen to them. They're unfiltered. You'll hear me have an emotional high sometimes, and yes, you'll hear me cry sometimes. I'm human. When people say things about me that aren't true, it bothers me. Knowing that I put as much effort into doing what I do. When I'd be willing to help any of them.
too much emphasis is placed on image. And I don't want any of you as my students that become good at this fall victim to that stuff. You can go into it with the, all the right mindset like I did. All I care about is make a thousand dollars a month and I'll retire at 40. And then when you taste real money, real fast, that stuff changes you real easy. And then when you make it known to people around you, your friends and your family, and they bring in their views about what it is that you should be doing and how you should do this and do that. And they can't even make their bills. They can't even get their car fixed because they don't have enough money. And you're making what they earn in four months in a day. And they're going to tell you what you're supposed to be doing. And they get angry because you're not listening to them. How many times do you have to listen to that before you blow up in their face and tell them about themselves? That's what I did. And I wish I could go back in time and take it away. Because those words cut. Your family members, they love you. Your friends, they love you. But they're not going to love you doing better than them. That's a rare quality in a person. And some of you are going to experience that, unfortunately. So the best thing you can do is mind your own fucking business. And don't let anybody else mind yours. Meaning, don't talk about what you make. Don't talk about what you're doing. Don't plan on sharing what you're planning on doing. The only thing you're doing is inviting people that are not doing it, won't understand what you're doing. They don't have the capabilities to even pursue it because if they did, they'd be doing it themselves. Proof of that, as soon as you tell them you're trading, oh, you're going to lose your ass. That's a pipe dream. They discommunicated their view of it, which they adopted from somebody else because they've never done it. Ask anybody that's making money today if you should pursue what you're doing. Fucking right you should. Absolutely you should. Why is it taking you this fucking long? Why aren't you already fucking trading? That's the response you're going to get from people that are successful. Get the fuck in here and let's go. You're missing out. Let's go. But in the beginning, you feel like you need that comfort of a friend and a family member to encourage you. You don't. You don't need that. I thought I needed it. You don't. That's a mistake to do that. You know who your best friend is? Your journal. You want to pour yourself out? Confide in someone that's never going to tell your story to anyone else? They're never going to spill your mistakes and embarrass you? Pour it into your journal. It's therapy. It's useful. It's effective learning. It tracks all your progress. It's never going to judge you. It's going to show you your highs and lows without any judgment. And it's the best fucking trading book you'll ever read. And you're the author of it. How impressive. Stop buying people's books. They're talking shit to you. Nothing new under the sun. Take all your attention, all your energy, and pour it into what you're doing. And once you learn how to do this, find a way to pour your efforts into others. Help other people. Take what you earn a month. It's okay, I'm going to take 5% of what I earn. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to find someone that needs it. Not to these organizations. Because that shit rarely ever goes into the people that they say they help. Go out there in the trenches. In grocery stores. You want to see somebody in, in, in need of things? Walk around your grocery store. Get yourself a cart. You get a loaf of bread. Things that you can walk around with and not thaw out. Spend some time and observe. Read the faces 
oh, those individuals in there. They're going to tell you a story if you just look. And you want to feel like you've accomplished something? Buy their groceries. And when they turn to you, and they can't even talk. And their eyes are full of water because it's tearful. That it feels real good. That feels really good. And they don't know you from Adam. They didn't ask for help. But you did it because you want to. And living life like that is very, very fulfilling. I've had so many people turn to me and just say, like, you have no idea how much this helps right now. And to me, many times, that feels like a divine appointment. Like, I was placed there at that time, for that moment, for that very thing. And that feels good. It has nothing to do with ego. It's not virtue signaling, because the only three people that know about it, well, four people that know about it, is God, the person in receiving it, me, and the cashier witnessing it. I don't try to make a spectacle out of it. I try to catch them when they walk up to the register when there's nobody else around us but me and them and the cashier. cashier. And I quietly, without embarrassing them, get the attention of the cashier. And I just mouth out and say, I got them. Don't charge them. They usually smirk. And they think, okay. And they tell them, good, it's already done. It's paid for. And they look b bewildered. Which is funny sometimes because they're like, what do you mean it's paid for? They're thinking they, they, they lost their mind. <laughs> they, I didn't even take my card out of my pocket. Yeah, how's it paid for? It's okay. It's paid for. And then when you turn around and see me, I'm smiling, sometimes crying. It feels good. And I'm only saying this to you, and I've said it before. I don't want you all to say, oh, that's nice of you, ICT. Because that's my reward then. I don't want that. I want to encourage you all to not think about what you're going to do for yourself and your own image online. I live in this kind of house. I drive this car. I can go on these vacations. Look at this watch I paid too much money for. What do you think feels better? Going out and buying a piece of shit Rolex watch, which I don't own a Rolex and I would never own a Rolex. They're fucking shit. They're garbage. Patek is the real watch. What matters more? Cars, trips, vacation homes, houses, or reaching out and touching someone else with your wealth and being impactful in a positive way like that. That's far better. I don't look at people that have more money than me that fly around in jets and shit and think, wow, I wish I could be like them. They don't live lives like I'm living. Even if you earned enough or you could take yourself out to once a month. You go out, you find someone in need like that. Randomly just pick them. Ask God to say, hey, put me in front of somebody that needs it. He'll find a way to get you there. And when you do it one time, the next time you're in front of your charts and you're looking for trades, you're going to be like, I want to do that again and I want to help someone else again. Father, let me be successful in this because at the end of the month, I'm going to take this much and I'm going to bless somebody with it. You want to see your accuracy increase? It will. Doors will open up and things like that. When you know it in your heart, you mean it, you're going to do it. 
okay, <laughs> let's see you do it. And you're going to find things get real easy because you're not living the life for you. Not just you and yours, but you're trying to be helpful to other people and the oil will not run out. I don't want you just being good traders. If that's all I wanted, I would just stop teaching because I've already taught you how to trade. I want you to be better people, better human beings, and I'm learning to be better in the process. I want you to find a way to look at your life and try to live it a little bit more purpose-driven. And it has nothing to do with religion. I mentioned God. But you may not believe in him. Doesn't change the fact that he does or doesn't exist. But you can still do these things and be rewarding to other people. And it just feels good. It feels good. For some of you who don't have any money, you can't imagine doing that. And most of you lie and say, like the lottery, if I win the lottery, I'm going to give this to that person. I'm going to buy a house. For if the won, you wouldn't have done any of those things. You would have been greedy. You would have kept every bit of it. And that's why you don't win. But how many of you have sat down and figured out, if you could make this much as a goal, how much would you be willing to give to someone in need? I'm not going to say, here, go, let's give us the charity. Here's the charity. I'm telling you that you find someone that you know in front of you is in need and you give them what they need. You're going to do it where you, they don't know you. They're not going to come back and ask for seconds and thirds and fifths. In many ways, you're appearing to them like an angel. You're not going to be there when they talk about you, but you can imagine they're going to go home and think to themselves, how on earth did that just happen? When I can't make it right now and I'm barely struggling to just meet ends right now, and this person just popped up right then and there, and now I got these groceries that I didn't have to pay for. What a relief. I like that. I like the fact that you don't even have to know my name. And I'm thankful for the opportunities that I'm given when I do it. It's been only one time that I can tell you that I did it. This young lady, she had a kid in her car, her cart, and, uh, I said, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick her. I followed her around the store, <laughs> afraid that she was probably thinking I was creeping. Right, so I'm keeping a good distance away. I'm waiting for. Her. I'm like, when? she's not putting anything else. She had a, a birthday cake in her cart, and I think she had a candle or two. So somebody's, somebody's birthday party, right? So finally, she makes it up to the, um, to register, and I hurry up and run up behind her, and I'm telling the cashier, I got her. Don't charge her. Lady goes, okay, you don't have to pay for it. She goes, what? I didn't, how's it free? And she pointed to me. And I just smiled to her. I said, uh, don't worry about it. She's like, huh. No, thank you. No, I appreciate it. Nothing. Just, huh. Out the door she went. That was a weird feeling. I didn't know what to think about it. <laughs> Still don't know what to think about it. I guess entitlement. Maybe they thought that, you know, maybe she thought I was trying to hook up with her or something to that effect. But that was the only one time that I didn't have the experience of feeling like it was a blessing. And I'm sure, you know, if you do it enough, you'll probably have one or two instances like that. But it never discouraged me of doing it. But if you sit down and you make a, a budget, for in your trading profits each month. 
You're going to go down to the shelters and drop off blankets, food to the places that give to the public. And you do so without any, I'm going to get a tax write off. Here's my information. If you do it that way, there's your reward. Test and see if what I'm telling you isn't true. Do it with the right motives. And that little bit that you're doing is going to magnify in your life in ways that you can't even imagine. Versus, I'm going to make so much money and I'm going to buy all these things that I see other people do that I want to have. I wish I had a car like this. I wish I had a house like that. Let me tell you something, having all that stuff, it, it doesn't make me happy. The money in my bank accounts, that doesn't make me happy. It doesn't feel content. It doesn't make me feel like I've arrived. What I love most about my life is I don't have to go to work for someone else. I can choose how I wake up and how I spend my day, and largely it's all of you. You are my day. You are my week. You are my month. And this year, you're my entire year. My day is spent with how I'm going to pour myself into you. What I can do to improve. Answer as many questions as I can along the process of doing whatever I'm teaching and discussing. And also get a therapy session out of it. <laughs> but cars and fast sports cars and <laughs> high dollar ticket things. It doesn't make you happy. It won't make you happy. And as soon as you share it with social media or you show your friends, as soon as you do that, it's done. It's done. Then what are you going to do to up it? How are you going to outdo it? For some of you, you're going to be in a lease payment for that sports car. We're going to go lease another one. Look at this one now. And then look at this one. And then look at this one. <laughs> at some point, you'll wake up and realize that this isn't what it should be about. The little hearts underneath a tweet or whatever Instagram does, I don't even know. It's too insignificant and short to last. You want your life to be purpose-driven. You want to be, in some capacity, philanthropic. It, it, it's You want to be... Um, a giver to some degree. You don't have to be nutcase like I am where I'm giving you more time than I give my own family. But in my mind, and this is what I reasoned with my wife with, I wrestle with this. So if I do this, I'm hoping that I'll have peace about it and I don't have to do it. And that's why I'm doing it. And that's the drive behind it. I could make a lot of more money. I could be making millions of dollars every single month. Again, over and over and again. I could charge for my live sessions. I could create that little join thing where only people could be a part of it if they paid. I don't want to do that and I will not be doing that. I don't know any other way for the people that are on the fence about me and what I teach to, to finally say, okay, I'm, I'm going to try now. I'm not going to waste my time with a guy that's going to try to sell me something later on. I'm not selling you nothing. I'm doing it in front of you. I'm calling it in front of you live. Everybody can see the same thing. If I'm right, you all see it. If I'm wrong, you all see it. I'm taking
taking your attention to the very things that you're supposed to be focusing on right now and you're learning in your process of taking in all this information, the very right moment at the right time, what, t- what subject matters am I talking about? The ones I'm teaching in that order. Should I stop studying all the other stuff? You should be only focusing on what I'm teaching right now. All of your attention should be focused on this. Because if you look at the live sessions, if you watch them late, like if it's something you couldn't be a part of in real time, they're at least an hour long. And now if you're watching them and you're doing it the right way, you're not just watching it. You're pausing it, rewinding it, listening to what I said, screenshotting it, and then taking notes. That's not an hour event. It's longer than an hour. And I'm doing it now every day. And how much are you going to study outside of that? looking at something else. All those other videos you can go back to. They're not going anywhere. I'm not deleting any of the videos. They're not going anywhere. But you will not have this experience after this year. I'm not going to sit in front of you every single day over the chart and talk about what it should and shouldn't do. This is the only time you're going to see that. So if you are looking for that experience, it's being given to you for free. Second Friday of November, it stops. So it doesn't make any sense for you to look at videos that are already up there and been up there on the YouTube channel for months now. They're not going to be deleted. They're not going to be removed. And they're not going to lose any of their effectiveness. The same lessons in them now will be effective in the, in the future. But what advantages will you dismiss and not participate in by not watching the live streams when you can? It would be foolish for you not to be engaged at least with that and keep your focus on that. How, how easier could I say it? Pretend that you just started as a paid mentorship with me, just like I was dealing with my mentorship group. Look at what I'm teaching you, what I'm showing you at the beginning of the week, throughout the week, the reviews, and the live streams. Keep your focus there. Do that. Walk forward with me each day, each week, each month. You will get what you came here for. When you have more time, then you can delve into those other things. But you have to at least consume what I'm producing each day and each week. That's the fresh bread. You can still live off of the old stale stuff that's on my YouTube channel. That stuff still feeds. It still does good. But like anything else, if you want it fresh, piping hot out the oven, you're getting it every single day here. And by focusing on that, you will get the sustenance that you are seeking as a developing student. Your focus is being guided. It's being directed to what matters most right now. Over time, it'll be more, but in the beginning, this is sufficient. So as a reminder in closing, I will not be trading on Monday. I will not be doing anything. I will not be talking about the markets, not Forex, not futures, not anything. I will be providing a teaching lecture that I will have up hopefully by one o'clock Monday afternoon, my local time, New York time. And with that, I wish you all a very pleasant weekend. Have uh, You can probably hear my stomach talking to me. It's hungry. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Enjoy your uh, Saturday and Sunday. And I'm sure I'll be uh, tickling your Twitter this week. Until next time, be safe.